Man, it's such an honor to be here with you guys and to share this message that the Lord has put on my heart. I just want to, before I start, I just want to say a few thank yous. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you to, is Jeremy Kepke back there? You are such an amazing, important piece of my life, and I thank you for not only being an amazing teacher, but being an amazing mentor and a spiritual father to me while I was at PBC. I want to thank all the faculty for just the amount of hours you guys spend creating these lectures and prayer and interceding for the students. If it, It's not without you guys that you have people going out and changing the world. I wanna thank my family for their support and their constant love and my beautiful fiance, Christiana, <laughs> for just the amount of times that she's just always encouraging me and reminding me that God is so faithful. I wanna start with a story. So when I first came to PBC, I had a really bad issue with an attitude. I would literally complain all the time. So when I got into my job at Custodial, shout out Custodial, that didn't change. And so I was always the guy that would always complain. And I imagine people probably didn't really want to work with me because I was just so negative all the time. But I got permission to say this, but eventually my friend Anelsi started joking around with me and he was like, Stop complaining, sir. <laughs> so that every single time I would complain, his voice would just echo in my ears. And I thank you so much for that wherever you are. I don't know where you are, but I thank you so much for that because the Holy Spirit has used that to shape me and make me who I am. Now, every time I want to complain, I just hear, stop complaining, sir, in my ear. <laughs> so I thank the Holy Spirit for an LC in my life. So on that, I wanna talk about attitude today. The title of my message is called Watch Your Attitude. The way you approach your daily life can either make or break your day depending on your attitude and outlook. I wanna start with Philippians 2, 14 through 15. that says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We need to understand that we are to do all things, not some things, all things without grumbling or disputing, not for our sake, but because we are to be a light to the world. The way you approach your daily life, like I said, can either break it or make it. So how do you approach school? How do you approach work? How do you approach that person in the coffee shop that messes up your drink? Do you approach them in love or do you approach them in anger and annoyance. Why did you mess up my drink? So 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. When we complain or grumble, not only are we not giving thanks, but we're actually rejecting gratitude. We're saying, no, today I actually don't wanna be thankful for what I have. I'd rather just to sit in my anger and my attitude and just choose not to be okay today. Something I found out is there's actually 86,340 seconds in a day. Are you going to let 60 seconds ruin the other 86,280 of them? <laughs> because of a situation or circumstance that happened to you. Another thing is that our attitude actually can affect others. Oftentimes, when we have a bad attitude, it actually affects those who are around us. I have a question. Did you ever have that one friend that was always negative, that you almost like never wanted to be around because they would always just say, I don't wanna do this, I don't wanna do that, I don't wanna do this, I don't like doing things. And so we wouldn't invite them and then when you would invite them, they would always be miserable the whole time. How many of you had a friend like that? Okay, just a few. <laughs> but even then you can have a positive outlook or a negative outlook on that situation. Hey, that friend is there, they're being negative. What if instead of reacting negatively and causing more negativity, you responded positively and said, hey, you know, I'm gonna encourage this person today and remind them that I love them and they're in my life. And when you do that, you'll notice something change. Not only the atmosphere between you two, but around you because the negativity will start to shift. Sometimes when we have a bad attitude or outlook on things, we can actually unintentionally hurt those we love. I am the first person to raise my hand and say, 
when I'm upset or I have a bad attitude that I say things that I don't ever mean to say. And five seconds later, I'm like, please forgive me. I didn't mean to say that to you. <laughs> so that's why we need a goditude. It's my own personal word I made up. It just simply means an attitude that displays godliness. Colossians 3, 16 through 17 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And you've heard it a million times, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything we do is for the Lord. It can either be done with a grateful heart or an ungrateful heart. When we are negative and we have a bad attitude, it can negatively affect our relationship with God. Because when we choose to live in the bad circumstances or the situations that are happening, it can actually sever our desire to spend time with him because we know that if we go into his presence, he's gonna say, hey, that's not right. We kind of want to sit in it. We want to be okay with our anger and our angst. And we just want to say, that person made me upset. This situation happened. So I'm just going to choose to not be happy. But we're supposed to give thanks in all circumstances. We're supposed to do everything for the Lord. When we have a bad attitude or negative outlook, we must realign our focus on God and come to him with a thankful heart. When you have a bad attitude, your remedy Come to Jesus. Yes, he's gonna tell you that you need to maybe change the way you're thinking about some things, but that's gonna do better for you than you could have ever thought or imagined. We need a goditude. <laughs> I hope you guys start saying that now, by the way. Which means that we need to respond in a godly way towards positive and or negative circumstances. So positive circumstances we should respond godly. Negative circumstances, we should always respond godly. In conclusion, whether a situation happened at school, work, home, or even though it's difficult in your daily life, we still need a goditude. When times are tough, we're angry, and we feel the right to be upset, we need to take it to Jesus and seek his word. I don't know how long, I know some of you are freshmen, some of you sophomores, juniors, seniors. You'll learn very quickly that the word of God has something for every circumstance in your life. And when you take that attitude that you're feeling towards somebody or something and you take it to the feet of Jesus and you start to seek his word on it, your heart will begin to change and realign and focus. When we have a bad attitude, sorry, I'm totally in the wrong area. Um, always find something to be thankful for, even when it feels like nothing is going your way. Nothing's going for you. There's always a way to a grateful heart. I'm not gonna disregard the fact that we have difficult circumstances in our life. Some of us lose family members, some of us lose friends, and we have a lot of difficult problems in our life. But hey, Jesus, thank you that I can breathe. Thank you that I have a place to sleep at night. Thank you for my friends and my family that encourage me on a daily basis. Recognize our attitude is not just internally affecting us, but it's actually outwardly affecting others. And lastly, thankfulness is the superpower to combat negativity and a bad attitude. When you step into thankfulness, when things aren't going your way, you're gonna find something to be thankful for. You're going to find, even if it's just saying you're thankful for who God is, I'm serious. No matter what's going on, you could just be like, God, I'm thankful that you're faithful. I'm thankful that you're good. I'm thankful that you're my refuge. I'm thankful that you're my rock. I'm thankful that you're my portion. I'm thankful because when you're thankful, you'll see the perspective switch in your heart, in your mind, in your thought life. Let's have a gratitude. Thank you guys. Real quickly, I just wanna welcome an amazing man of God. I want everyone to give a good hand for Jade.
Wow. <clears throat> Thank you, guys. This is on, right? Cool. All right. D, D3, come on. All right, well, we made it. This is the end of the semester. Who thinks that this year has gone by way too fast? Because it definitely has for me. And, um, you know, looking back throughout these years, I've had a, a lot of good memories, and then, you know, I've had good memories, and then I've had COVID memories, am I right? You know, it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. So, um, yeah, I just want to give a couple, couple thanks to, firstly, my family. Uh, they're not watching, but, you know, wouldn't be here without them. You know, maybe they'll uh, listen to the recording after this. But, yeah, so also thank you to my friends. You guys know who you are who have, who have pushed me um, mentally and spiritually throughout these couple years. And, um, and lastly, I want to thank the staff for, for pouring into me, for having faith in me, um, for really just uh, giving us this space to, to seek God. And specifically, Pastor Jason, I, I didn't see you during, during worship, but I see you now. Um, that, you know, you, I, I've got the pleasure to meet with him every Wednesday, and he has been like a father figure to me. Um, sorry. And, uh, you know, he's, he's listened to all my problems, and he's, he's given me good advice, so thank you. Okay, so just to jump into my sermon, I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks now. I mentioned it in the SLT meeting, but it's, I wanna talk about summer stagnation. And I wanna, I don't think summer is talked about that often. And um, to be honest, I've struggled with it a lot. You know, winter breaks, summer breaks. I've just maybe chilled a little bit too much, you know? And so, um, so I've been, you know, it's been hard for me to find motivation, and sometimes I could be lazy. And so I would argue that it's easier to grow your relationship with God during the school year because, you know, we're constantly being filled with classes and practicum, right? Um, but when summer rolls around, like, we don't have that anymore, right? We don't have that. So we need to be aware of how easy it can be to just speed by and speed through summer, and we need to just slow down and really grow our relationship with God, right? And so, you know, um, for me, I, I kind of just like wake up during the summer, maybe throw on some, some TV, go to work, come back. But, you know, it doesn't have to be that way, you know? It doesn't have to be like this mundane thing where we're just waiting for the semester to start. Because um, summer isn't a time to be lazy. It's a time to rest, though, you know? And so let's be a people that grow our relationship with God, you know? And in past semesters, like I've seen, I've seen growth and then, uh, you know, really running after God's heart. But then summer rolls around and by the end of summer, I feel like sometimes, like I, I, all this momentum is just like, it's gone, right? And who, who has maybe felt that in the past break? Maybe sometimes, yeah. Um, you know, first semester freshman, you haven't experienced that, but I th use this sermon as a warning, a warning to make sure that, to really just dive deep into the word. And um, the way to ensure that you make the most out of your summer is the level of intimacy you have with God, right? So sometimes it feels like our devotions kinda, we do it out of a duty, right? But, you know, Mark Jones, he puts it this way, that God waits for us all night Right, He waits for us all night so we can wake up and worship him and commune with him. And how excited do we get? You know, how excited do we get to wake up and, and have the opportunity to spend time with God, right? Let me say this to you, that you might be bored in your devotions because you're focusing on it's a routine and not about relationship, right? So another thing that you know, Pastor Jason has, has said to me that's really stuck with me is that it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if devotions feels like a duty. It doesn't matter, right? Because sometimes, um, you know, because it, it, de devotions is something that we're all called to do. God doesn't feel, God doesn't feel bored when we talk to him. So how, why should we, right? Because he, he's all in it. He's all in for us. But, you know, are we gonna be all in for him, you know? Sometimes we need to take a step back and really evaluate our heart. And, you know, summertime is, it's a perfect time to do that, right? 
It's a perfect time. Also, we need to keep in mind that growing our intimacy with him is applying what we're reading into our lives, you know? So if we're not applying what we're reading, then growth will not take place. And then the next way we can ensure to to have a spirit-filled summer is being intentional with our time. I'm gonna take a real quick drink because, you know, I get parched. Thank you. All right, so time management is so key to not feeling stagnant. So this is a very, it's just a very practical thing that when you go to bed earlier, you're gonna have more time in the morning to, to spend with him, right? You know, it's very practical. So <laughs> come on. So, you know, if you, you know, journaling and, and praying and reading your Bible, maybe even, maybe even spending time on a walk, listen to worship music, who's ready for some sunny mornings? You know, I am. Come on, man, I hate this weather. I'm gonna go move to Mexico or something, am I right? This is crazy. <laughs> so yeah, at this point, you might be thinking, Jade, 30 minutes is enough, right? 30 minutes is, is good enough, right? But let me tell you that if God's the most important thing in your life, you're gonna, you're gonna make time for him. You are gonna make time for him. In fact, if you're not making time for him and putting him first, then you're kind of wasting your time and your money here, right? Right? There's a reason why we're all here, right? And so we don't have like classes. I mean, we do have classes in the summer if you're taking online classes. But, you know, most of us aren't. So how are we going to use that extra time, right? Um, you know, summer is, is a time for, to have fun, you know? But let's not negate the actual reason why we are here, you know? I wanna share my schedule from freshman year. And uh, so I would wake up, I need to go a little fast. I woke, I wake up, I, I would, this is freshman year, right? I would wake up, I would turn to social media for about an hour and then maybe watch, <laughs> this is so bad, I'm so sorry. I would uh, watch maybe some entertainment until I have to go to work. And then I would think that like having a good relationship with God is listening to a Judas Smith sermon. So I would do that on my way to work. Is, I'm so sorry, it's so bad. And then, <laughs> And then I'd come home and then watch Netflix till 2 a.m. That's so sad. That's so sad. I, I was left feeling miserable, literally feeling stuck and depressed. You can even ask Caleb. I came, when he came back from Pennsylvania, I was so skinny. Literally, I, was so, I would literally not take care of myself. It was really bad. So please, learn from my mistakes. Like... I didn't think people were gonna laugh at this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, just, it's just practical things, you know, like going on a walk, uh, like pick up a sport, you know, it's just very practical. Don't waste your summer. Um, let's see, the best thing you can do for yourself during the summer is really surrounding yourself with, with people who are like-minded, right? You know, a, a cool idea, just very practical things, you know? A, a cool idea that I've heard is people starting like preaching clubs and and stuff like that. I know Caleb Stussman, he, his small group is like starting a word study or, um, or a character study, something like that. It's in the works. Cool. Anyways. <laughs> so yeah. So just find something that, like the, the skills that God has called you to, really hone that in. Take this time to hone that in. And, um, but overall, you're going to survive summer. You're not going to survive summer all by yourself, but surrounding yourself with people. So let's not forget what we're here for. We're here to go closer to God, not just giving our 100% during the semester, but also during the breaks, right? And I encourage you to use this break to really grow, number one, your intimacy with God, and number two, to really um, be intentional with your time. So as I end, I wanna leave you guys with an assignment. I know just one more assignment to put to the list, right? But this one's really important. Not the other ones aren't, but you know. Um, <laughs> to sit down before summer starts and really plan out your summer. Plan it out, you know? Like, what goals are you gonna put into effect? Um, what do you wanna grow in? And what are some things that you know you need to look out for going into summer, you know? It's all about setting yourself up for success. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you guys for listening to my sermon. I hope that you guys take something out of it. And while I was reading it, I was really just like, um, like 
searching where my heart lies going out of PBC, not even just during summer, but you know, the rest of life, I guess. And um, so yeah, I just wanna introduce the next speaker, one of the coolest people, give it up for Bridget. everyone. So, my name is Bridget Blinn. Uh, some of you might not know me because um, I, at the end of my junior year, May, almost a year ago from now, almost, I got married to Luke Blinn. Okay, <laughs> wonderful man. And then I became an uh, off-campus student and eventually an online student. So if you don't know me, that's why. Um, so, but what I want to talk about today is you know, more than just my last name over these last four years have changed. A lot has changed. I actually came here to PBC suicidal, was still suicidal for a little while in the beginning, um, and I was desperate for hope, yet at the same time I was kind of doubtful I was gonna find it. You know, it was actually a miracle of God that I even came here. Um, the process was really long, um, and it wasn't immediate, but every step was an important lesson, and I've eventually been chiseled into the person I am today, and I'm still being chiseled. So there were, there were some uh, pivotal moments um, in the healing, but today I'm gonna talk about one specific. Um, I, it was around my, I didn't learn this until my sophomore year, second semester. I had reached out to Rachel Arnold, which thank you so much. I wanna thank the mentors of this school. Like guys, get a mentor. Thank you, Rachel Arnold. Yes, please clap for her. She was awesome. Well, I had reached, I had reached out to her because I had noticed I had a lot of, um, I was sort of unstable. <laughs> and I'd noticed a lot of weaknesses in me that I, I really wanted to work on and I wanted to grow. But in the course of this mentorship, some really serious, painful life event happened that sort of revealed the way that my mind had been working. And through this mentorship and a book that she, she mentored me with, which is called um, Switch On Your Brain by Dr. Caroline Leaf, I learned that God has given us the ability to be masters over our mind. Um, because, you know, I thought depression and anxiety was something I had to, like, beg God to take away from me. And I begged and begged. And I would, I remember specific prayers sounding like this, like, God, I can't do it. God, I can't handle this. Please, I can't do it. But real quick, that's not true. Thing is, like, God has actually given us everything we need to conquer sin and darkness. He has not left us so vulnerable, it's called his Holy Spirit, you know, he's in us, he's with us, and the Bible. So, First Peter 1.3 says, his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So God did answer those prayers for freedom, but he didn't zap away the depression. He, um, he gave me he showed me how to wield the sword, and, how, and he gave me the strength to do it. So I serve at uh, the Tiger Campus Youth. <laughs> and <laughs> and if, you, if you serve in youth, you know recently we went through a series on mental health. Well, Dave, Pastor David in one of his sermons said something that just like hit spot on, and he said some of us treat our, our um, mental health like Jesus take the wheel. Like, Jesus, take the wheel, take it from my hands because I can't do it on my own. I'm letting go. And it's like, I can remember one summer, talk about summers, one summer I um, was just totally anxious. I was lost in my thoughts. I was having um, intrusive paranoid thoughts. And at all times you'd find me with like either worship music or the Bible playing in my earbuds because I was afraid of taking them out uh, to hear what was, what was coming in. And it, I, I was running to God. That's good, you run to God. But I wasn't doing what God was telling me to do, which was to, um, which was to test the thoughts that I was having and to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. 
So that's what Romans 12, 2 says. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, goodbye, mind. <laughs> <laughs> then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. Um, so bottom line, here are some practices that I wanna leave you with that I went through this, with, this tr with this book. There are some specific practices that Rachel uh, had me do. Number one, I wanna leave you with be on the offensive. So be on the offensive. That one summer, I was on the defensive. I was scared of the thoughts. I was just trying to put up a shield, and there are moments for shields, but um, God, the thing is, is that fear was over me. I wasn't fearing God, you know. God did not call us to a spirit of fear. He called us to be more than conquerors. So we're not running away. We're heading in with our swords in our hands, right? So one exercise that Rachel had me do is to pick, pick a toxic thought or memory and for at least, at least 20 minutes in the morning, apply truth to the lies and do this for 21 days straight. So this is the lies and this is truth. So it says, Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Um, so guys, through this process, memories that literally used to send chills down my spine, just like traumatic stuff, were like stripped of all of their power against me. Everything. Like, <laughs> and this is just what God does. This is what his, this is what his word does, you know. It, it, we don't, it doesn't come up void. So, no, um, step number two, listen to truth more than your own lies. Who knows? We've got this going 24 seven. Look, even when you're sleeping, this never sleeps. So what are we filling it with? Um, are we living our lives just listening to the lies or are we living our lives listening to the truth? So another part of the exercise was um, to list to, so let's say in the morning, in that 20 minutes, I had um, taken one specific verse and, uh, and slapped it onto the lie and said, no, you know, that specific verse you would think about several times throughout the day because you need to remember this. You need to meditate on the word of God. Um, Ephesians 6, 14 says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. This is a piece of clothing. You put it on and you wear it all day, the truth. You can't take it off. So there's that. Then my last and final practice I wanted to leave you with is to test thoughts that enter your mind. This was a foreign concept to me. I thought thoughts were thoughts and you just think them. I didn't know that you could accept or deny specific thoughts. So, you know, everybody needs to take responsibility for the thoughts that we have. And this can apply to any area of sin. Because Jesus said, if you lust over a woman, you have committed adultery. So if an impure thought flickers across your mind, remember to immediately reject or deny it. Don't be lazy. Don't let it sit there. Because we can be lazy with the thoughts that we think in our head. We can be lazy. And you've got to decide that you're fighting this battle. And remember, we've got to fight this battle like we actually believe God is the Almighty. Okay? Um, so... Last thing I wanna say is I want to encourage you all. I know that I just talked about a lot about anxiety and depression and controlling your thoughts. And I know that when you are depressed or anxious, the last thing you feel like you have strength for is to fight. But God is always with you. I know depression and anxiety can overwhelm you, but God has never left you. And I'm convinced that nothing can separate you from the love of God. So, really, when you're in those moments, you just need to turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So, I'm going to introduce Drake, lovely man of God, servant of the Lord. You catch Drake on any given day and he's serving. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Good job.
<laughs> uh, let's see it. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Oh man, the timer's already going. I haven't even started talking yet. Can we get a restart or? Oh geez. Okay. Uh, oh wow. Okay, they're not. They're they're really going. Um, <laughs> Real quick, thank you guys so much for this amazing opportunity to, to be able to come speak here. Um, it's been an amazing, for oh, they did restart it, thank you. <laughs> um, seriously, this has been an amazing ride uh, and these last four years have gone by crazy quick. Um, there's just a few people that I wanna thank. Um, first off, D2 guys, where are you at? Hey, there we go. <laughs> thank you for making this last year so memorable for me. <laughs> Uh, I've been a detour for life, like Noah said. Um, all four years I've been in that dorm, but this has been one of the most memorable by far. Um, and I, I just wanna thank NLC and Caleb Stutzman for helping make that possible. You guys have been an amazing um, assistant dorm leaders and I'm so grateful to have you in my life. Um, thank you to the staff for giving me this opportunity and for the last four years of pouring into me and investing in me and believing in me when I didn't prove it. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was like, it's just been an amazing blessing being with y'all. And then the last two, um, Serena and Taylor, thank you so much for showing me what true sisters in Christ look like. You guys are amazing, and I'm so excited for the journey ahead of you guys. And to my best friend, Nate, in the back. <laughs> thank you so much for, for being there for me through the thick and the thin, man. Um, if you guys are taking notes today, the title of today's sermon is called Expecting God's Move. And when we look at expectation, we find a couple things in um, this one verse in Hebrews 11. And Hebrews 11, one says, now faith is the assurance, assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And while faith and hope are only just a little part of expectation, it's that last part we always look over. We always focus on faith, we always focus on hope, but we forget the conviction of the things that we don't see, that conviction that drives us. It's that expectation of what God's gonna do next, the conviction that he is faithful. And it tells us one thing about expectation is that it isn't based on the things of this world that is seen, but in the unseen things that God does. And if you're taking notes, my first point is that expectation is faith-filled. Hebrews 11 is this honors list of, of people in the Bible who did this so well, who they, who they had faith and God used them in mighty ways, and one of which was Abraham. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with them of the same promise. For he is looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And I look at this and I, I, I look back to the passage where God called Abraham. And it was in Genesis 12 where this happened. And it talks about the, the, the distinctions of the Abrahamic blessing. You know, He called Abraham out into the wild to be a blessing to many nations, the father of many nations. And, and to be the father eventually of, of the line of Christ. And, one thing that it implies that we often don't see is that Abram knew God's voice already. It says that he was 75 years old, but at God's word, at God's command, he went out into the wilderness and left everything behind, everything in his hometown, everything he had built up to this point. And it infers one thing, is that Abraham had a life filled with knowing God's voice. This expectation was immensely faith-filled. We see this elderly couple going out from their home and starting over, starting on nothing, but they didn't forget the moments where God had come through for them. We see that expectation is not based on what will happen, but it's based on what has happened before. It's based on the things that God has done, has promised, and has come through that he was faithful on. The second point is that expectation is faithful. Now, we look at this scripture now in the Gospels in Matthew 14, and the context of this is that Jesus just fed the 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And we see him dismissing the crowds and now putting the disciples onto the, lake, or the, the Sea of Galilee, actually, and they're going to the other side. 
And now Jesus, as he's dismissing the crowds, he's, he's telling the disciples he's gonna catch up with them. And this is where we actually jump into the story here, is Jesus coming to them, walking on the water. And he's saying, take heart, it is I. And Peter responds to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come out. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. You see, Peter, um, Peter took a step of faith in that moment. And he experienced Jesus in a personal way. But the moment Peter started sinking into the water was when he took his eyes off Jesus. And this tells me another thing about expectation is that it comes to pass through faithful obedience to Christ's call, not disobedience. These expectations, these times where God comes through in your life, they're, they're these, these times where God gives you a chance to act. And, and the, the fulfillment of that, the obedience on that act is often preceded by an opportunity of faith. Peter asked Jesus to command him to bring him out onto the water with him. And while Jesus did give Peter the ability to walk on water, it was preceded by that very opportunity of faith. So we should expect God to move as though he has already done it. We must act with obedient faith as we expect him to come through. And this isn't the only time where we see the disciples encountering Jesus in the Sea of Galilee. There's actually another time in John 21 where they are in that very same sea, about 100 yards off at night fishing. And it's Peter and six other disciples out there. And it's right after Jesus had died, just a couple days after Jesus' crucifixion. And, in, you know, I can only imagine the pain the disciples had gone through. They just gave three years of their life to the man who claimed to be the Messiah, who proved to them that they were the Son of God. Make no mistake, he proved it. But yet they're seeing him um, now as a crucified. They just came from his crucifixion and now they're wondering what the last three years of their life were worth, what they were, um, what they were for, what they dedicated to. And it's almost this place of hopelessness where they're actually going back to the trades they were in before Jesus had called them. They were fishermen by trade, Peter, James, and John. And... Now I can just uh, see Simon Peter out of all of them. In verse three, he tells the disciples, I'm going fishing, and they agree to go out with him. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And I see him specifically because this is exactly how Jesus had called him to ministry. In Luke five, it says that Jesus cast out into the lake of uh, Gennesaret, and he he told Peter to go out and cast out the nets for a miraculous catch of fish. And this was the first time Peter saw Jesus act. This was the call to ministry. This was the dedication that Peter gave to Jesus. But now we see him in a sea in the same situation with the disciples, but Jesus isn't there. And I see him casting the net out, just trying to get a bite at the net. I see him picturing this call in his head I see him even looking out towards the mountains across the way on the other end of the Sea of Galilee where he saw Jesus feed the 5,000, where he saw him do so many miraculous things, where he saw him walking on the water in the midst of a storm to the disciples, who by the way were miles ahead of him. And I can just see him longingly staring as he's waiting for that catch, hoping that this is just a terrible dream, that he's just gonna wake up back in that boat and he's gonna be with Jesus again. But he picks up the net and there's nothing. Now, we come to him at verse four. And it says, just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was him. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And the disciples, groggy from staying up all night, discouraged and hopeless, respond, no. We didn't catch anything. And so the man persists. Well, why don't you cast the net on the right side of the boat? And at this, I'm imagining some disciples are kind of annoyed. They're like, oh, look at this wise guy, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think we tried that. You know, we would sit up all night, but, you know, Peter does it anyway. 
cast the net on the right side of the boat. And it's amazing at the catch of fish because they weren't able to haul it in. And John turns to Peter and exclaims, it's God, it's the Lord. Jesus, he's here, it's him. And it's, this, is, this is the moment where it clicks for Peter. And he finally, he dives out of the boat and he swims to shore. <laughs> and he meets Jesus there. And this is what I wanna end here for you guys, is that expectation is fulfilled with God's breakthrough, however, however unexpected it might be. You may be in a position where you're like Peter, where you're, you're, you're in that boat and you're waiting on something from God where there's these hopeless circumstances around you and you're just waiting for something to come through. I wanna encourage you, keep waiting, keep praying, expect well. Remember that even, even as some of us here today are moving into other grades, we're moving into the next steps of our lives, the next chapters. Seniors, we're graduating. We're leaving the last four years that we've, we've made here and that we've known. I want you to remember three things in the expecting. One, remember what God has done. Remember how you heard his voice in the beginning and remember how he's been faithful. Two, be faithful to where he's called you. Just as Abraham was called into the wilderness and as he was faithful to that call, be faithful to where God is calling you after this and even in the season of waiting at PBC. And three, wait for the breakthrough. Expect the unexpected and wait for God in the breakthrough. Thank you guys so much. Woo-hoo!